Hey everyone, welcome back to Infinite Podcast. I'm your host, juggling through the digital jungle with insights, anecdotes, and a dash of skepticism. Today we're digging into digital footprints. Is true online anonymity a myth? In a world where data is gold, privacy often seems like an afterthought, doesn't it, Simon? Oh, privacy in the internet. That's like trying to stay dry in a pool. Corp giants slurping up data like it's happy hour. You think you're incognito, but really, you're just wearing a hat with your name on it. Spot on. The hat analogy is amusing, but it's the sad truth, man. Going incognito these days feels like a placebo. And still, everyone seems surprised when their anonymous data gets leaked or sold. It's as if putting up a flimsy fence and hoping the neighbors won't peek over. Exactly. It's wishful thinking. Plus, every like, click, and share is a breadcrumb leading back to us. The whole I've got nothing to hide attitude just doesn't cut it anymore. Protecting your online presence isn't about hiding. It's about not wanting to be tracked every step of the way, like we're all part of some big digital reality show. Right? The nothing to hide argument is a cop out. It isn't about hiding, it's about choosing what you want to reveal. And the digital reality show you mentioned, honestly, no one signed up for that. Every move calculated, predicted, and influenced. It's not just privacy, it's autonomy at stake here. Are we controlling our online narratives or are scripts being written for us behind the screens? So if we're talking autonomy, how much control do you think we really have over our online stories? Are we the directors of our digital lives or just unpaid actors on a stage we didn't build? I'd argue that we're mostly unpaid actors, Simon. Control is an illusion when algorithms dictate what we see and do online. Our behaviors are shaped by design. There's a reason why you can't stop scrolling. The stage, it's structured to keep us engaged, clicking, and sharing. Sure, we can manage privacy settings, but at the core, those settings are created by the very platforms that benefit from our data. Digital autonomy seems like a grand idea until you realize the script is pre-written by the infrastructure of the internet itself. Not to mention, the whole system's rigged with trackers and cookies. It's like Hansel and Gretel leaving crumbs, except we're dropping bits of personal info. And those privacy settings? More like privacy placebos giving us a fake sense of control while they feast on our data. We click agree faster than light without even scanning those terms, because let's face it, who has time for that novel? So true. It's a click fest to oblivion. No one reads the fine print. Life's too short in those terms, a labyrinth. Privacy placebos indeed, they're sneaking cookies into our pockets while we're looking the other way. Speaking of sneaking cookies, reminds me of my aunt's dog, a ninja at swiping snacks off the table. So, one day I'm watching this little Houdini, and I put some chips on the coffee table, think nothing of it. I turn around for like two seconds, and poof, they're gone. The dog's giving me the innocent eyes, but there's chip dust on her snout. It's kind of how these online trackers work, you know? You look away for a moment and suddenly they've snapped up everything about you, leaving just a trail of digital crumbs. Sneaky, right? Totally sneaky, just like that dog. We get chip dust, they get our data, and pretend it's all business as usual. It's stealthy, it's crafty, and frankly, it's a bit of an online heist. Online heist is right like we're walking ATMs and every click's a withdrawal. No vault, no guards, just open digital wallets getting picked. So, in this great digital heist, how do we better guard our wallets? Is there a safe combo lock we're all missing? Or are we just stuck hoping for the best as they pickpocket our digital dough? Guarding our digital dough? Man, I'm out here setting up fake accounts like Kevin with three free trial extensions. Change my name, new email, who's Kevin? They don't know. If these companies are magicians, then call me the guy in the crowd secretly knowing it's a trick, still gets amazed but whispers, I'm on to you. They've got a bag of tricks, but there are moves we can make. We're talking VPNs, tighter privacy settings, understanding permissions on apps, that's crucial. Ditching the cookie trail is like a digital game of hide and seek. Also, regular checkups of our digital profiles and scrubbing what we can. Digital hygiene isn't just for Kevin and his fake accounts. It's for all of us wanting a fighting chance at keeping our digital wallets somewhat secure. 
Digital hygiene, sure, but let's face it, even with VPNs and privacy gymnastics, the internet's got a memory like an elephant. You clean up what you can, but there's always some trace left behind. And hey, avoiding trackers is one thing, but good luck scrubbing your past from the all-knowing search engines. It's like trying to erase permanent marker with a rubber band. Good luck with that. Absolutely. Digital footprints are tough to shake. It's naive to think we can fully erase our online pasts. Search engines are like digital archaeologists, digging up everything we thought was buried. Navigating online anonymity is a minefield. We can tread carefully, but there's always something that slips through the cracks. Even with diligent efforts, that permanent marker you mentioned isn't coming off easily. So when it comes down to it, the best we can do is be mindful of the new marks we make, knowing full well they might outlast us on the digital canvas. Absolutely. Every mark is a legacy in the digital world. But here's a thought. While we try to control our digital footprints, what stories will they tell about us generations from now? Makes you wonder what digital archaeologists of the future might discover about us, doesn't it? Yeah, our digital legacies can lead to surprising tales. Jumping off that, it's interesting how amidst carving out these legacies, there's some pushback with all this tracking and privacy invasion like GDPR in Europe or CCPA in California, trying to give us controls over those marks we leave behind. It's an evolving battlefield, with cookies, not the eating kind, crumbling under new rules. Are we seeing real change in tracking behavior of corporations, though? What do you make of this tightening web around web cookies and privacy? GDPR and CCPA sound great on paper, but I'm skeptical. It feels like putting a Band-Aid on a bullet hole. Sure, corporations might be shaking in their boots, a little. But let's get real. These companies have turned data tracking into an art form. They're just going to find sneakier ways to keep doing it, like painting over a see-through window and calling it privacy. They're shapeshifters, man. The minute you make a rule, they've already morphed into something new. Hold up. You mean to tell me these companies might just dodge the new rules? That's wild. It's a bit like playing whack-a-mole then. Every time we think we've got a handle on privacy with laws like GDPR and CCPA, they just pop up in another form. These corporations are crafty. The whole thing turns into a game where they're always one step ahead. Makes you wonder if the fight for real privacy can ever truly be won. Hey, new listeners, you've jumped in on a real spy novel of a topic. We're chatting about how these big corporate giants are tracking our every move online. Yeah like digital detectives, but less Sherlock Holmes, more Big Brother sneaky types. We've been picking apart those laws like GDPR and CCPA that rolled up to the party, promising privacy and control over our digital breadcrumbs. But you know what? These companies are getting crafty, possibly dodging rules like internet ninjas. We'll keep tossing ideas around. Stick with us as we unravel this high-stakes game of hide-and-seek with our own data. So, how do you think these new privacy laws actually stack up against the old-school cookie and tracking tactics? Enough muscle to clean house, or just a light dusting? These privacy laws. It's like trying to tackle an octopus with a net full of holes. Sure, you might snag a tentacle, but the beast has seven more. Web cookies. Tracking. They've had years to evolve. New regulations are just making them step up their game. So yeah, it's less of a clean house, more of a never-ending game of tag. We're it and always chasing. The real question is, do these companies even want a clean house or just look tidy when we peek through the window? Whoa, that's an eye-opener. You're saying these laws like GDPR and stuff are probably just a minor setback for these data-hungry companies? Like, our info is still getting snatched up while we think we're in the clear. Wild how they can be that slick. And here we were thinking those cookie consent pop-ups meant we were calling the shots. Feels more like a show than actual control over our digital lives. Sure, Joe, we click accept on those pesky pop-ups because who actually reads all that stuff, right? But here's the kicker. Even with these flashy laws, tracking's not really stopping. It's just getting trickier. Real talk. Companies are shifting from blatant cookie tracking to more obscure methods, like fingerprinting our devices. 
It's like they've ditched the cookie for a full course meal of our data without us noticing. The control we think we have is mostly just window dressing, leaving us open to some serious peeping toms. But hold on, we can't just throw in the towel here. Let's flip it for a sec. These laws like GDPR, they've got teeth, fines are huge. Companies aren't completely heartless. They're pivoting because they have to. There's more transparency now, even if it's not perfect. Plus, with tech like Apple's intelligent tracking prevention and browser moves towards cookie-less futures, there's a legit shift happening. It isn't all doom and gloom. We've got some stake in this game. It's a tough fight, sure, but privacy advancements are steady wins, not overnight revolutions. You reckon those fines are stiff enough to make the big shots sweat, huh? But Joe, do you really believe that transparency from companies is legit? or just them doing the bare minimum to avoid getting slapped with fines. Are these steps towards a cookie-less future and Apple's magic tracking prevention showing signs of real change? Or is it just another fancy way of keeping us in the dark while pretending we have the power? I'm not entirely sold on those transparency efforts, Simon. You've got a point. These companies tend to do whatever it takes to avoid fines, which could just mean better hidden tactics instead of real change. And about cookie-less futures and Apple's tracking prevention, sure, there's steps in the right direction, but let's not kid ourselves. It's still a cat and mouse game and we're not always the cats here. Terms like privacy and user control can be smoke screens while companies invent new ways to track us without setting off alarms. Wait, hold the phone. So you're telling me that all these privacy tools and cookie warnings might just be a fancy front? Behind their smoke and mirrors, big companies could still be tracking our every click? Man, that's a massive game of peekaboo we didn't sign up for. And here I thought cookie-less meant we were heading towards some privacy utopia. Guess it's back to the drawing board, with a magnifying glass in one hand and a privacy policy in the other. Spot on, Simon. We've got to keep a sharp eye out. Cookie-less doesn't mean trackless. Companies are leaning into stuff like device fingerprinting or tracking pixels that tell them who we are without the old school cookies. Privacy policies? Those things are novels written in alien lingo. So while we're patting ourselves on the back for navigating cookie pop-ups, they're playing 3D chess with our data. What's scary is not just the level of tracking, but how invisible it's becoming. It's one step forward, two steps back in this digital tango. Man. Picture this, we think we've got it all figured out with those accept cookies buttons, feeling like internet ninjas. Meanwhile, companies are back there tracking us with invisible lasers or something. It's like playing hide and seek with a bunch of toddlers who keep peeking. They think you can't see them, but their little feet are sticking out from under the curtain like, found your data. Wild times, friends, wild times. Totally, it's like we're stuck in this wacky game of data hide and seek. Just when we think we've found all the hiding spots, companies unveil a new curtain they're hiding under. Or maybe they create one out of thin air. So listeners, next time you click accept, just picture those tiny feet sticking out. It's a reminder that there's always more to the story of our online privacy or lack thereof. Now, what other digital sneakiness might be going on that we haven't uncovered yet? Hey Joe, speaking of digital hide and seek, Let's talk about the invisible cloak of the internet, incognito mode. Some folks treat it like a Harry Potter charm, believing they're magically hidden from all eyes online. Well, grab your wands, listeners, because we're about to reveal some hilarious truths and fictions about this misunderstood spell of the web. Ah, incognito mode, the digital world's invisibility cloak. People crack me up when they flick that switch and act like they've just vanished from the grid. But guess what? That's not how it works. You might be hiding your browsing history from your mom or roommate, but your ISP, companies, and basically the whole web's tracking brigade, they still see you, like playing hide-and-seek with a sheet over your head. Sure, you can't see them, but they definitely see you. Yeah, Joe, let's not even get started on those folks who think incognito mode is the Fort Knox of online privacy. Newsflash. It's more like a shower curtain, kind of gives you privacy in your own home, 
but does nothing against peeping toms or hackers. So when people are all hush-hush about their secret browsing sessions, I just have to laugh. They're about as undercover as a bright pink elephant at a garden party. You're not fooling anyone, buddy. Remember, incognito ain't so neato when it comes to true privacy. For real, Simon. It's pretty distressing when you think about how many people are out there in their digital bathrobes thinking they've got a steel door between them and the world. The reality hits, and it's more like tissue paper. It feels like we're failing at Internet 101, and these misconceptions aren't just funny. They can leave people seriously exposed. We've got to get real about what undercover means online, because folks really believe they're locked down in Fort Knox with that incognito shield, which is wild to me. It's absolutely crucial we shed light on this. People deserve to know their actual online privacy status. Yeah, it really tugs at the heartstrings, Joe. Thinking about how vulnerable people are because they buy into this idea that incognito shields them, it's rough. They genuinely believe they've got this armored digital bubble and nobody wants to find out their safety net is full of holes after they've already taken the plunge. You're right, we've got an urgent job to peel away these myths and get the real deal out in the open. It's not just a tech issue, it's about looking out for each other. Everyone deserves the truth about their online cloak, even if it's more of a plastic rain poncho than a titanium shield. Absolutely, and let's not forget the classic. Thinking incognito mode is like a superhero suit that makes you invincible. You hop online and feel like Iron Man, but really, it's more like you're just wearing a t-shirt with I'm Invisible written on it. There you are, browsing away, thinking you're Tony Stark, when in reality you're more like his assistant, just hoping nobody notices you sneaking an extra cookie from the jar. Newsflash. We all see the crumbs, folks. Oh, come on now, Joe. That image of strutting around in an I'm Invisible t-shirt, thinking you've got Iron Man's armor, is just spot on. To be super clear to our listeners, Incognito mode isn't the digital superhero suit you might wish for. It's pretty much just a party mask covering your eyes while everything else is on full display. And those crumbs? Yeah, guys, they're not just in the cookie jar. They're like a breadcrumb trail following you across the web for anyone with the right tools to see. Makes you think twice about that private browsing, doesn't it? Absolutely, Simon. Incognito mode can lull you into a false sense of security, but the truth is, it does zilch against surveillance beyond your browser. This isn't fiction. It's a mask, not an invisibility cloak. When you're incognito, sure, you leave no footprints in the sand at home, but online, there's a whole beach full of your tracks for those who know where to look. It's like whispering in a room full of microphones. Just because you're whispering doesn't mean you're not being heard. Keep that in mind next time you go incognito. Absolutely, Joe. It's wild how many of us whisper through the web in incognito, thinking we're ghosts. Next time you go stealth mode, remember, it's more of a gag for your browser's history than anything else. Makes you wonder what else we got totally wrong about our online privacy. So listeners, what are your own tales from the incognito side of life? Share those invisible yet oh-so-visible moments and let's unpack this mystery box. So, speaking of the illusion of privacy in the digital realm, it highlights just how crucial it is for us to lock down our virtual lives properly. From picking ironclad passwords to going ninja with the right tools and educating our kids about the digital footprints they leave, there's a whole toolkit we should be using. Let's dive into the nitty gritty of securing our online presence especially for families out there trying to navigate this maze. How do you secure your personal bat cave on the web? Let's get into it. Right, Joe. First off, ironclad passwords are like the keys to your virtual kingdom. You wouldn't use a flimsy lock on your front door, so why do the same online? Mix it up with letters, numbers, symbols. Make it look like a cat walked across your keyboard. And consider a password manager. They're like the Alfred to your Batman, always there, keeping your secrets safe. Then there's the VPN, your very own Batmobile for surfing the internet highway undetected. It cloaks your real IP like you're using stealth mode in Gotham City. A good VPN is worth its weight in gold for privacy. And let's not forget about secure messengers. 
These are your encrypted bat signals that only the right Commissioner Gordon can decipher. Not even the nosy Riddler snooping around can crack them. For parents, talk about privacy like it's the new stranger danger. Kids need to know their digital breadcrumbs could lead the big bad wolves right to grandma's house. Simple chats can go a long way in forging a savvy little Bruce Wayne who knows how important it is to keep their virtual self on lockdown. And here's one for you, Simon. Imagine if every time you used a weak password, invisible ink would splash it on your shirt for the world to see. Talk about airing your dirty laundry in public. Now that's a bizarre and hilarious visual, but might just be effective enough to encourage better habits. That's hilarious, Joe. But for real, can you imagine walking around with I love cats one, two, three, splashed across your chest? So what do you think? Does the threat of wearing your password on your tee make you want to beef up your login game? It sure does, Simon. Nobody wants their weak passwords out there for all to see. So what do you think are the biggest hurdles families face when trying to step up their online privacy game? Biggest hurdles? It's that some families think it's too complex, like they need a degree in cyber ninjaology to figure it out. But honestly, Joe, it's not rocket science. People get scared off by the jargon, VPN, encryption, two-factor authentication. Sounds like a foreign language. So here's the deal. We got to break it down for folks. It's like teaching your kid to ride a bike. Not everyone's going to be doing wheelies right away, but you start with the basics, right? Simple steps first. Strong passwords are your training wheels. Get those down and you're on your way. Then you add layers, like the VPN, which is just your safety gear for when you go out on the busy streets of the internet. Keep it real. Keep it simple. That's how we'll tackle this beast, one bite at a time. You know, Simon, it reminds me of the time my nephew wanted to sell his old comic book collection online. He set up his account with a password that was just Superman. I chuckled at first. It was fitting for a nine-year-old fan. But then I thought, wait a minute, this is a teachable moment. So we sat down and I showed him how to create a strong password, a mix of uppercase, lowercase, numbers, and symbols. We even used his favorite superhero names as inspiration, which made it fun for him. Then we talked about keeping his new password to himself, like a secret identity. Just from there, we gradually went on to talk about why privacy is important and setting up extra security steps, kind of like building his own Justice League for his online presence. And in the end, he didn't just sell those comics. He also learned vital skills for safely navigating the digital world, all starting from good password practices. That's spot on, Joe. Walking them through it with something they love, like superheroes, that's genius because it sticks. Another key point for families, don't stop at passwords. Dive into two-factor authentication. It's like having a superhero team up to guard your accounts. Adding those extra layers of security is like putting an invisible force field around your personal data. And managing digital legacies, that's huge. Just as heroes keep their identity safe to protect the ones they love, we gotta think about what happens to our online selves if we're out of the picture. Setting things up correctly ensures that your virtual bat cave doesn't turn into villain territory if you're ever not around to defend it. The big takeaway, Joe? It's all about keeping safety fun and relatable, whether you're 9 or 90. Because in the digital age, we've all got a secret identity worth protecting. Imagine if every one of our passwords was a superhero. Would yours withstand the villainous hacks or crumble like a sidekick in a B-movie? Time to suit up your login credentials. Look, if passwords were superheroes, I'd say half of them out there are like the extras in a superhero flick. You know, the ones who don't even have a speaking part before they're zapped. We're talking password one, two, three level. So how about we level up? Let's not just create a superhero password. No, let's build an entire Avengers style password protection team. First off, the leader, your strong, unique password with a mix of characters. Then there's two-factor authentication, the trusty sidekick always asking for ID at the door. Throw in regular password updates, like your powerhouse character that evolves every season to face new threats. And don't forget to add a VPN into the mix, your stealth hero, cloaking your tracks like a master spy. Bottom line, 
you need a league of extraordinary password security measures because facing the internet with a single weak password is like showing up to battle wielding a toothpick. Come on now, let's get those digital defense suits on. So sticking with that superhero theme, which Avenger do you think best represents a strong, multifaceted password, Simon? Iron Man, hands down. Think about it. Tony Stark's suit has layers of tech, defense mechanisms, and he constantly upgrades it. That's your ideal password. Multifaceted, complex, always evolving, and virtually indestructible. Plus, it can fly under the radar when necessary. If that doesn't scream strong password goals, I don't know what does. No way, Iron Man. That's brilliant. Stark's armor is tech and defense rolled into one, and if our passwords had even a fraction of that sophistication, we'd all sleep better at night. I'm telling you, Simon, this is the kind of simple yet compelling imagery that can really motivate people to upgrade their password game. And who doesn't want to be a bit more like Tony Stark? Keep it complex, keep it evolving. Now that's advice worth its weight in vibranium. Well, I agree Iron Man's a solid choice, but let's not put all our eggs in one basket. Relying on just a strong password is like Iron Man without backup. Good, but not foolproof. Every Avenger brings something unique to the table. So, how about we call Black Widow into this mix? Hear me out. She's stealthy, a master of disguise and espionage. That's our VPN right there. Disguises your location, keeps you under the radar. And hey, what about Hulk? When things get real rough, Brute force won't crack your data because you've got encryption on your side, making your files a tough nut to crack, like trying to punch through Hulk's green skin. Really, cybersecurity is less about being Tony Stark, more about assembling your own Avengers team, where each member, password managers, antivirus software, secure messengers, plays a vital role in guarding your digital universe. Go solo and even Stark's armor might get dented, but with a full team, well, that's when you're truly superhero strong online. Absolutely, Simon. This might be controversial, but relying too much on any single measure or technology is like expecting Iron Man to handle every global crisis solo. Sure, he's a powerhouse, but even he teams up because there's strength in numbers. You've got to have layers, like a good sandwich or a complex character. Black Widow's stealth aligns perfectly with VPNs, masking your moves online while the Hulk represents strong encryption as that brute force shield. Add Hawkeye's precision, think regular security updates, and Captain America's leadership, a reliable password manager, and you've got a strategy. While some folks focus solely on passwords, let's not undervalue the rest of the cybersecurity team. They're all key players. Every layer you add makes it tougher for the bad guys to get through. That's what true digital resilience looks like. It's a well-assembled squad covering each other's weaknesses. And as fun as superhero analogies are, this is real-world advice. Build your team wisely, stay educated, and always be prepared to adapt. I tell you what, Joe, if there was an Avenger for backing up your data, it'd be Doctor Strange because he literally knows the value of a good backup plan. Remember that time loop deal? Yet people treat backups like that one oddball superhero who only gets a call when things go south. Time to change that. Right, Simon? Data profiling is everywhere. It's like we're all living in a superhero origin story, except the radioactive spider biting us is big data. It's giving us powers we didn't ask for and certainly don't understand. We're trying to navigate through a world where algorithms decide if we get that loan or job before we even make our case. It's kind of wild when you think about it. Wild? It's like we're living in an algorithms world and we're just filling in the blanks. Data profiling can feel like you've got an overzealous sidekick narrating your every move, useful sometimes, but way off the mark other times. Take job hiring algorithms, supposed to find the perfect candidates, right? But what if they're screening people out for all the wrong reasons, like gaps in employment history that have nothing to do with their skills? That's not a feature, it's a bug. And credit scores, don't even get me started. An algorithm crunches some numbers and decides whether you're worthy or not. The mess up is real. Good folks getting stiffed because their data shadow doesn't glow right. The trick is separating helpful personalization. Hey, you might like this from creepy surveillance telling you 
what you should like. We need transparency, some sort of decoder ring to understand how these data decisions are made, because this isn't just math, it's our lives they're plotting points on. Absolutely, Simon. While personalization can lead us to discover things we genuinely love or streamline our experiences, the line blurs into surveillance pretty quick when every click and like starts shaping your digital profile, sometimes inaccurately so. Consider data profiling in advertising. It's how you get ads for dog food weeks after you've Googled something for a friend's pooch. Handy? Maybe once. Now it's just clutter because they missed the context. You don't have a dog. We need to flip the script here. People should have clarity on how their data is used and the right to contest decisions made by algorithms. And crucially, there's got to be a way to correct a profile. Because as it stands, if your digital shadow trips, it could take a while for you to stand back up in those systems' eyes. This isn't science fiction. It's our reality, and we'd better grasp the plot before it twists again. It's like a game of digital hide-and-seek, Joe. Except we're not the ones doing the seeking. We're always hiding, and big data's it with x-ray vision. No kidding. We're like, just browsing for fun. Oh no, now my feed's full of ads for inflatable garden gnomes. Big data sees you when you're sleeping, knows when you're awake. Santa's got nothing on these algorithms. Oh, inflatable garden gnomes are just the tip of the iceberg. It's like we've got these secret admirers that know way too much, except they ain't sending flowers, they're sending targeted ads. And Santa? At least he checks his list twice. Here's the thing. When algorithms go rogue on our data, it's not just annoying ads. We're talking life-changing stuff. You didn't get that loan? Algorithm says no. Job application ignored? The algorithm ghosted you, friend. Now don't get me wrong. Profiling can be benign, like suggesting a new track that becomes your jam. That's the sweet spot. But where do we draw the line before it feels like we're just characters in some twisted simulation being played by big data? We gotta educate ourselves and push for laws to keep our digital doppelgangers in check so we can say, hey, that's not me. Otherwise, we risk becoming NPCs in our own story, letting the code dictate our plotline without having any say in the narrative. Time to grab the joystick, folks, and take control of the game again. Hey, new listeners, just caught us knee-deep in the data profiling saga. We're discussing how our online lives, from shopping to job hunting, are increasingly shaped by algorithms, these digital puppet masters pulling strings based on our data. It's a world where ads for quirky garden gnomes stalk your browser, and job prospects could be derailed by an AI side-eyeing your resume. We agree. Some data help is cool, like that playlist pick that nails your music taste. But... When we start feeling more like background characters than heroes of our own story, that's when it's time to sound the alarm. Keep tuning in as we crack the code on taking back control from Big Data's grip. Funny you mentioned being knee-deep, Joe. Reminds me of the time I was actually knee-deep, in mud at this music festival. See, I had this app on my phone recommending bands playing at the fest. Cool stuff, predictive algorithms doing their magic, so there I am, sloshing through the mud to see this indie band the app swore I'd love. And I get there, and it's packed, like sardine can level crowded. Midway through a song that's kinda meh, it hits me. Every muddy person here probably got the same recommendation. Turns out, we're all covered in mud, swaying to a tune that's okay-ish when I could've been somewhere else, discovering an off-the-radar band without the crutch of an algorithm telling me where to go got me thinking about those personal suggestions we get handed daily. Sure, sometimes they're spot on, but other times we gotta wade through the mud of generic picks to find our own beat. I mean, real discovery is getting lost in the choices, not just following digital breadcrumbs laid out by some code, right? Talk about a plot twist, Simon. What if the real headliner was the muddy misadventure and not the band? Makes you wonder how often we miss those hidden gems because we're tuned into the algorithm's greatest hits. Plot twist for sure. It's like we're all in this B-movie where the main character blindly follows GPS only to drive off a cliff. Our digital GPS, these algorithms, they're supposed to be toolkits, not rulebooks. We need to find those hidden gems, whether in music or life, by taking a few wrong turns on purpose. 
I mean, if listening and discovering is about the journey, algorithms have us just teleporting to the destination. Where's the adventure? I'm not saying throw out your apps, but maybe, once in a while, ignore that because you watched suggestion. Next time you're online shopping, venture off that recommended path. Who knows? Maybe instead of ending up with another garden gnome, you land on something wild, like an inflatable T-Rex costume. Now that's a conversation starter. It takes some guts and maybe a bit of blind faith, but hey, nobody's story got interesting by playing it safe within the code lines. Let's untrap ourselves from data profiles and start writing some unplanned chapters. Choose your own adventure has got nothing on us. Navigating through the data jungle without following the algorithmic paths is like choosing the scenic route. It's riskier, but the rewards can be huge. A unique soundtrack to your life. Products that scream you louder than any profile could guess. Should we all take some cues from Simon's muddy festival adventure and seek out our own roots in the digital wilderness? Who knows what surprising stories we'd find ourselves starring in. Let's keep peeling back the layers of this complex digital world together. What routes have you taken that defied the algorithm's compass? Joe, just riffing off that idea of carving your own path in the digital landscape, it really begs the question, can anyone actually stroll through this virtual jungle anonymously anymore? Every click and like is a breadcrumb trail leading right back to us, which sure doesn't feel very private. Privacy online is starting to feel like one of those mythical creatures. Everyone's heard of it, but have you ever met someone who's seen it? It's more than covering our digital footprints. It's about weathering this never-ending data storm without getting soaked. Is throwing on an invisibility cloak even possible, or are we all just out there flashing our data whether we mean to or not? Hey there, fresh ears. You're tuning into Infinite Podcast, where we've just plunged into the deep waters of online privacy. Is true anonymity extinct, or can we still go incognito amidst the internet's prying eyes? We're dissecting a digital world where every click echoes back to us, and questioning if we can sail these virtual seas without waving our private flags for all to see. Stick around as we chat about navigating those secret swells in today's exposed online ocean. Incognito mode, Joe more like in slightly less conspicuous mode. True anonymity on the internet is like ordering a salad at a steakhouse. Sure, you can do it, but will it be satisfying? Will it really hide your craving for that juicy data steak? I'm not so sure. You've got VPNs and privacy-focused browsers, yeah, but there's always a digital paper trail someone can follow if they really want to. Anonymity online isn't just about hiding, it's this game of digital dodgeball. And let me tell you, some of these data collectors have an arm like a pro pitcher. And privacy, does anyone even read those terms and conditions? It's like signing a deal with the devil, but you didn't bring your reading glasses. You think you're signing up for a newsletter, and next thing you know, your inbox is flooded, and somewhere an algorithm's making bets on what brand of socks you wear. The cost of anonymity is high, both in effort and what we potentially miss out on. Because admit it, we all love when our feed gets us. We enjoy the convenience. The real kicker? We're trading pieces of ourselves for ease and free services. But hey, nobody said sailing the virtual seas was going to be smooth sailing all the way. Right? Right on, Simon. You know, I always wonder if one day we'll treat privacy like vintage collectibles. Everybody wants it, but nobody can figure out where to find it anymore. Joe, privacy's like that one clean t-shirt at the thrift store. You might find it wedged between an 80s tracksuit and a questionable Hawaiian shirt, but even then, chances are it's got someone else's spaghetti stains on it. Ha ha. Ha ha, spaghetti stains. Classic. So, if we're rummaging through the thrift store of online privacy, how do we spot that clean t-shirt? What are our best tools or tricks for keeping some of those sauce splatters off our digital tees? When we're digging in that digital thrift store for privacy, you gotta know what you're looking for. Tools? Sure. VPNs, encrypted messaging apps, ad blockers, they're like stain removers. But your shopping smarts? That's key. Read up on privacy policies, yawn I know. And those pesky cookies that websites love to serve? Start saying no thanks. It's all about conscious clicks, my friend. And remember, even with the best tools, 
there's always going to be a little sauce that slips through. Kind of makes you miss the days of anonymous chat rooms and pixelated avatars, huh? Now, our profiles practically broadcast what brand of cereal we chowed down on this morning. So yeah, keeping clean in the online thrift shop takes work. Sacrifice some convenience, maybe pay for services instead of trading your data. Is it foolproof? Nope. But at least you'll cut down on those secondhand spaghetti stains. You're hitting the nail, Simon. But let's get real. Most folks aren't up for a privacy crusade. We sigh at cookie pop-ups, but click accept to make them go away faster than last year's memes. It's like we're saying, sure, track my every move if it means one less click. Convenience is king in the digital domain, and privacy seems more like the court jester, tossed some coins for our amusement, but not taken seriously. We talk a big game about wanting anonymity, then log into socials to broadcast our days. Posting breakfast? Check. That cool new indie band you discovered, without help from an algorithm? Double check. Suddenly that invisibility cloak looks more like a neon sign. Maybe the question isn't whether anonymity exists online, but if we even really want it when push comes to scroll. You've got it, Joe. Wanting online privacy is kinda like craving a workout while lounging on the couch. You like the idea more than the effort. We say we want to stay hidden, then share every salad and sunset. It's like we're playing hide-and-seek, but yelling out our location every two minutes. Ready or not, data collectors, here's everything I love. Hold on, Simon. Think about it. While we openly share our lives, there's a crowd desperate for privacy. They're the ones knee-deep in settings, turning off permissions like whack-a-mole champs. They're paying extra for secure services and avoiding social platforms like a spoiler to their favorite show. Their reason? Simple. Data breaches like digital wildfire threaten to consume our sensitive info. Plus, with cyberstalking and identity theft as real as any street mugging, that effort towards privacy isn't just paranoia, it's preservation. Isn't it all about having the choice to share or not to share? That's where true value lies. Not everyone treats online spaces like a personal diary. Some still treasure that chest of secrets. And sure enough, They've got the sweat on their brow to prove that anonymity ain't no easy feat. So, Joe, the real deal for you is having that choice to share or go silent. That's like the golden ticket of the internet, right? How do we balance that share button with the shield one to keep that choice truly ours? Absolutely, Simon. The power of choice is the internet's golden ticket. Balance comes from educating ourselves on privacy settings and understanding the trade-offs we're making. It's about using those shields, VPNs, encrypted apps, careful sharing, judiciously. We need to champion transparency in data practices and support policies that give us control. Diving into privacy isn't just a solo swim, it's a community effort too. If we can both protect our personal spaces and respect others, maybe that choice becomes less of a tightrope walk over the digital divide. It should be about empowerment, not just evasion. So let's take ownership of our online presence and shape it on our own terms. You nailed it. That's the dream. Clinging to our choices like a lifeline. Protecting privacy is shared duty. Let's be digital warriors, not just users. Own your online life. That's it. Digital warriors unite. Your online life is yours to command. With every tool and choice, we shape the landscape of our digital identity. Keep wielding your choices like the mightiest of swords, folks. And question is, how will you carve out your piece of privacy in this vast virtual kingdom? Keep the conversation going and shield up. Let's continue to unravel this puzzle of anonymity online. Speaking of digital warriors and online presence, Joe, ever notice how it's like we're all starring in our own spy movies, trying to sidestep those trackers with schemes that would make even a Black Mirror episode seem tame? It's no longer computer whizzes and hoodies. It's your grandma putting tape over her webcam. Let's not forget those comedic geniuses crafting clever ways to mock the algorithms chasing us. It's like reality's version of Mr. Robot's quirky cousin. Oh, that reminds me of this hilarious episode with my uncle. This dude believed his smart TV was spying on him. Yeah, we're in tinfoil hat territory here. So what's his master plan? He starts watching shows he's completely uninterested in just to throw off any would-be data collectors. 
Here he is, pretending to be this die-hard fan of soap operas just so the algorithms get confused. Imagine these execs scratching their heads because according to their data, this rugged outdoorsman is suddenly all about dramatic love triangles and cliffhanger hospital scenes. It's just pure comedy gold. We're not sure if it worked, but hey, the man's dedicated to his privacy and unwittingly became a soap opera trivia whiz in the process. Haha, ha, that's brilliant, Joe. Your uncle's like the Houdini of digital privacy, minus the straitjacket and plus a remote control. Just picture him, eyes glazed over, binging daytime soaps while the confused algorithms try to pivot his ad profile from fishing gear to the latest in melodramatic mascara. It's comedic chaos. Talk about being committed to throwing off the scent. It's like we're in this digital wild west where you've got to outsmart the sheriff of surveillance town. People go to such lengths, like those friends who create fake online personas, turning their digital trail into a wild goose chase or when autofill suggests something bizarre based on these loop-de-loops to mislead trackers. That's algorithmic improv at its finest. It's loophole comedy, and sometimes, the laughs on us. But here's the twist, Simon. Not everyone's a master of misdirection. There are folks out there creating fake personas only to forget which they they're supposed to be today. It's like watching a dog chase its own tail, hilarious but futile. They get ads for hiking boots one day and high heels the next, and imagine explaining that at a family dinner. Then there's this. If you try too hard to sidestep, you might trip over your own digital feet, like when someone decides to only search for items they hate to confuse trackers. Next thing, their friends are gifting them neon fanny packs because, hey, you searched for it. Privacy may be priceless, but let's face it, sanity's pretty valuable too. The loopholes become laugh traps when we realize living like we're undercover agents isn't sustainable or maybe even necessary. Outsmarting an algorithm is one thing, but let's not outsmart ourselves in the process. Absolutely, Joe. Dodging digital shadows is one thing, but when your anti-tracking tactics end up with a closet full of neon fanny packs, you've got to ask yourself, who's really winning this game, the algorithm or me? And sidebar. Should I be hosting an 80s revival party with all this unexpected gear? Ha ha! Funny you should mention an 80s revival party, Simon. Reminds me of the time I actually threw one. This was way before I got savvy about online privacy. So, committed to authenticity, I did all my party prep using incognito mode. I didn't want future employers to think my professional research involved leg warmer trends and mullet maintenance. Fast forward to the party night decked out in full retro flair, only to find out most of the invites had bounced back. In my quest to stay off-grid, I'd used a throwaway email account that flagged as spam. Guests missed the memo while my tracker trackers thought I had some intense passion for vintage workout videos. Talk about getting tangled in your own fishnet gloves. It's like these privacy MacGyvers we try to emulate, but sometimes it's more like we're scripting our comedy skits. So there I was, Joe, feeling like a tech ninja gone rogue, all the while my top secret party planning basically just turned my inbox into an 80s museum. No one RSVP'd because spam filters treated my invites like junk mail. And what's the deal with incognito mode, anyway? It's like wearing a fake mustache at a masquerade ball, thinking no one will recognize you, when in reality, it doesn't hide you from the host of the party the internet provider still knows it's you behind those stick-on whiskers. Ah, incognito mode, Simon. The digital equivalent of a superhero mask that doesn't quite cover all your face. It's like telling the internet provider, you can't see me, while they're handing you your drink at the ball. It makes us ask, what's privacy in a connected world? Is it a possible dream, or just the punchline to an inside joke we've yet to fully get? Folks, Keep crafting those quirky tricks and elaborate decoys. We laugh, but maybe in those encrypted chuckles lies the key to our digital liberation. Or at least, a good story for our next episode. What's your funniest algorithm dodge? Let's keep unmasking this masquerade called online privacy together. These cat and mouse games we've been talking about, dodging trackers with soap opera plots and 80s party shenanigans, they're just the tip of the iceberg. There's this whole underworld of digital ghosts, folks who've taken hiding from Big Brother to new heights. 
Ever wonder how these people just vanish online? They're using some serious digital smoke and mirrors. Can your average Joe really pull that off without going off grid and living in a cave? And what happens to family game night when dad's busy bouncing emails through seven proxies? Let's dive into the vanishing act of becoming a digital ghost. Digital ghosts, Simon, more like digital ninjas, except their dojo is the dark corners of the internet. Vanish online? Sure, if you've got the time and tech savvy. But let's get real. Could Mona from accounting become invisible to Google with a couple clicks? Doubtful. Here's the dirt. A lot of these invisibility cloaks are complex and not that accessible. I mean, does everyone know how to set up advanced privacy configurations or use burner phones without slipping up? And about family life, imagine trying to trim your entire household's digital footprint. That's not just erasing cookies. It's convincing your partner and kids to go full mission impossible. Good luck getting granny on board with encrypted chats. The payoff might be personal privacy, but clock the cost. Family bonds could fray when you're teaching toddlers not encryption, but evasion. Is going Casper online worth the fade out in real life? Worth pondering as we weigh invisibility against intimacy in our digital day-to-day. -day. You've got me thinking, Joe. Digital ghosts might just end up haunted by the real-life connections they ghosted. Going full phantom mode online, cool spy movie plot, or a fast track to becoming that mysterious hermit uncle with an aversion to group texts. Exactly, Simon. Digital ghosting isn't just a solo mission. It's a group project with reluctant participants. Your tactical disappearing act might work wonders against data brokers, but the collateral damage? Let's just say Aunt May won't be amused when her birthday well wishes bounce back from your ultra-secure email server. Plus, this whole outwitting your digital shadow gig has got me skeptical. Picture this. You're at the supermarket, paying cash to avoid card tracking, but your phone's GPS pinged your location anyway because you played that one round of Candy Crush in the checkout line. Oops. And really, how practical is it for the average person? Swapping phones every week, drowning in VPNs and proxy servers, sounds like a full-time job without the 401k benefits. At what point does evading trackers turn from strategic move to paranoia-driven chess game where you're the only player? Sure, we can attempt the digital Houdini escape, but maybe the grand illusion is thinking we have to disappear completely to control our online presence. What if winning the game means smarter moves, not leaving the board entirely? Joe, it's like we're trying to outsmart a digital Sherlock Holmes with every online step. Sometimes we win, Sometimes we're just tripping over our own internet cables. Maybe the trick is not to vanish, but to throw some digital curveballs and keep them guessing. Funny you should say that, Simon. Reminds me of a time I took my buddy's challenge to go full incognito at this local bar's trivia night. Camouflage cap on, no familiar faces around, and using only cash. The goal? Nobody recognizes me, not even the regulars. Halfway through, I'm acing questions, blending in. Then, out of nowhere, my phone buzzes. A friend tags me in a post about the very event. There I am, location exposed, my cover blown sky high by social media, not my savvy competitors. The real kicker wasn't that I got caught. It was seeing how thin the line really is between staying under the radar versus being front and center on someone else's feed. It showed me that sometimes it's less about dodging every digital bullet and more about just knowing where they might come from. Keep your head down, but keep playing the game. Just like those digital curveballs we're talking about. Stay unpredictable, but stay engaged. Well, Joe, staying engaged while under the radar, isn't that the paradox of our times? It's like trying to play hide-and-seek in a glass house. Funny you mention hide-and-seek, Simon. Speaking of games, did you know online gaming communities are practically master classes in digital dodgeball? With all the monitoring in these platforms, gamers might as well be gearing up for a surveillance showdown without even realizing it. Turns out, many popular games are crash courses in things like encryption and anonymity. Gamers picking locks and dodging security systems in-game are brushing up on some serious cybersecurity skills. Who knew your nightly questing was secret agent training? So, let's level up this conversation. Is your favorite game teaching you to be a cyber sleuth? 
Cyber sleuth training, Joe? Seems like a stretch. My nephew spends hours building forts and games. Doesn't make him the next architect. Sure, gamers learn the odd trick here or there, but talking cybersecurity skills? That's like saying eating cake preps you for baking competitions. However, those stealth missions and code-breaking quests are sneakily slipping in lessons on staying one step ahead, like digital ninjas learning from their pixelated playgrounds. It's less about crafting hackers and more about teaching our screen citizens the ABCs of digital defense without them even realizing they've enrolled in the course. Mind-blowing, huh? Hang on. Gamers might be the unsung heroes of cybersecurity? That's wild, like stumbling into a secret society where everyone's sharpening their digital dexterity without even knowing it. They're out there solving puzzles, cracking codes in-game, and here we are, worried about our emails. Think about it. Every time they spot a trap or dodge an in-game surveillance cam, they're flexing those virtual vigilance muscles. Maybe giving your 12-year-old cousin props for his gaming habits isn't that far-fetched. It's like the games are training them in the funniest way possible for the real-world Big Brother. Gamers versus digital surveillance. It's got a nice ring to it, doesn't it? Who knew that Raid Night was actually boot camp for cyber privacy buffs? Wait, gamers are on the front lines against digital peeping toms? I had no clue. You say practice raids might as well be secret cybersecurity workout sessions? That's bananas, but kind of genius. So wielding a game controller could be like swinging around a digital sword of justice, or whatever they use in those fantasy games. It's hilarious if you think about it. Next time someone says they're gaming, maybe what they're really saying is stand back. I'm training to dodge the digital overlords. Game on, cyber guardians, game on. Absolutely, Simon. Gaming, the new cloak of invisibility in the virtual world. Next thing you know, we'll have stealth gamers replacing their job titles with digital vigilante on LinkedIn. Imagine that resume. Special skills include evading digital dragons and shield bashing through firewalls. I guess if all else fails, just throw down a smoke bomb of cheat codes and hope for the best, right? Future interview question. How'd you learn to secure our network? Well, there was this one night, 10 hours into World of Thieves. Game on indeed. Hold up. Digital vigilante on a resume? I'm not sold yet. We're giving too much XP to these gamers. Sure, they might have some moves, but let's be real. Knowing your way around a digital battleground doesn't quite translate to outsmarting hardcore internet snoops. Saying gaming makes you a cyber guardian is like claiming Monopoly turns you into a real estate tycoon. There's a jump from in-game strategy to actual cybersecurity chops that we might be overhyping here. Next thing we'll hear is folks thinking they can firewall their house because they aced a tower defense game. Or maybe my grandpa was a privacy pioneer for beating Solitaire without getting tracked. Oh wait, he just didn't own a computer. Getting through World of Thieves without a scratch is one thing. But the real-life internet is playing on hardcore mode with no respawn points. You've got a point, Simon. There's definitely a canyon-sized gap between in-game heroics and actual cybersecurity know-how. Swiping digital gold in World of Thieves won't make you an encryption expert any more than wearing stripes makes you a zebra. But here's the thing. Those in-game strategies have underlying principles similar to real-world digital self-defense. Think pattern recognition, problem-solving under pressure, and tactical decision-making all core skills in the privacy battleground. Sure, smashing virtual cameras in a heist game isn't equivalent to securing your data against sophisticated cyber threats, but these games can spark interest, awareness, and basic knowledge that, when supplemented with real education, could form a solid defense line against prying eyes. Just don't expect to duel with hackers wielding nothing but a virtual sword and bravado from last night's raid victory. Spot on, Joe. Gamers picking up a thing or two about digital dodging is a bonus level they didn't even know they needed. And who knows, with the right push, today's gamers could be tomorrow's encryption enthusiasts. Maybe all this play is more powerful than we thought, a stealth tutorial in our world of watchful eyes. So what's next? Achievements unlocking cybersecurity careers? Let's keep an eye on those leaderboards. Absolutely. Speaking of leaderboards and tutorials, 
This whole idea of Easter eggs in games might just be the perfect analogy for learning secret privacy tricks. When you think about it, these hidden gems and enigmas tucked away in popular titles aren't much different from discovering those clever little ways to keep your digital footprint light. You know how in some games players band together for epic treasure hunts, deciphering riddles and cracking codes? It's eerily similar to real-world encryption and anti-surveillance tactics, digging through layers of obscurity to find that pearl of privacy hidden within our day-to-day -day tech. On that note, let's dig into some popular titles known for their Easter eggs and see if we can uncover any cryptic connections to the art of staying private in a public world. What virtual vaults have gamers unlocked that could teach us a thing or two about keeping our data under wraps? All right, Joe, diving into Easter eggs and uncovering privacy secrets sounds cool, but let's be real. Most gamers chasing these hidden nuggets aren't exactly donning hacking hoods and putting on digital trench coats. They're more about the bragging rights than a trip down cybersecurity lane. These in-game puzzles are elaborate and engaging, sure, but equating them to true blue encryption know-how? That's like saying reading spy novels makes you an undercover agent. It's one thing to stumble upon a secret game level. It's quite another to understand the complexities of personal data protection against multifaceted threats. The skills for solving in-game Easter eggs typically tap into lateral thinking and teamwork rather than the technical prowess needed for genuine digital shielding. It's not that there's no value in these gaming experiences. It's just that we've got to keep the fantasy fun distinct from the serious biz of internet safety. True, Simon, equating in-game Easter egg hunting to actual encryption mastery may be a stretch. But imagine this. Maybe games are the gateway, the light intro, into a world where curiosity about secrets leads to genuine learning about privacy. Just think, today's Easter egg hunter could get that aha moment and turn into tomorrow's cybersecurity buff. Now, wouldn't that be a plot twist worth a spot on the leaderboard? Sure, it's a stretch, Joe. But wouldn't it be wild if some riddle in Age of Spies sent someone tumbling down the rabbit hole and bam, next thing you know they're winning cybersecurity competitions? Turned from Easter egg fanatic to encryption guru, now that's a gamer evolution story I'd tell at parties. Exactly, Simon. There's this fascinating potential for what starts as a game to ignite a spark for deeper learning. Take Easter eggs in Age of Spies or similar titles. Players unraveling those could develop an instinct for pattern recognition and problem solving, key aspects of cybersecurity. And here's the kicker. It's not just about games directly focused on spying or thievery. Puzzles in any game demand a form of critical thinking that can be transferable to understanding privacy. Who would have thought that secret levels hidden behind walls might inspire someone to think about firewalls? That Easter egg hunter's journey from beating bosses to besting cyber threats is more than party talk. It's a real path to personal empowerment and internet safety through the fun of gaming. Not every gamer will take that leap, but for those who do, watch out. Digital world. Fair point, Joe. Games are like the appetizers for the main course of cybersecurity smarts. The fun lights start before the real nitty gritty. Could totally see a gamer leveling up to encryption whiz. Game on. Totally, Simon. And just think, if a gamer does become a cybersecurity expert thanks to Easter eggs, they're set for life. Every job interview. So how did you get into encryption? Well, it all started when I discovered the secret cow level. Imagine that, a hidden bovine bonanza being the tipping point for a life dedicated to data defense. Talk about an origin story. Move over, Batman, there's a new hero in town, and their superpower is turning gaming fun into serious security chops. Well, hold your horses and cows. Picture this. A gamer claims Easter egg hunts taught them encryption. Sounds cool, but not so fast. Getting good at real-life cybersecurity isn't about uncovering virtual secrets. It's about understanding complex systems, and no game can teach the intricacies of actual encryption algorithms or security protocols. It's critical thinking versus specific technical knowledge, like knowing a magic trick without grasping the physics behind it. Sure, gaming can spark interest, but mastering privacy on the internet requires specialized education and hands-on experience that goes way beyond finding Easter eggs in digital fields. 
Games start the car, but they don't keep it running down the road to robust cybersecurity knowledge. I hear you, Simon. Easter eggs might awaken curiosity, but hitting the books or servers is where the real encryption grunt work happens. It's like a teaser trailer compared to the full feature film of cybersecurity. Sure, looking for hidden details teaches awareness, but connecting the dots in complex IT environments, now that demands a deeper dive into tech's tough terrain. Games may light the spark, but it's dedication and proper training that keeps the cybersecurity fire roaring. Totally, Joe. Games might flick the lighter, but they're not the bonfire of cybersecurity learning. Loading up a saved game's one thing, saving your digital skin, is another ballpark. And let's not forget, Easter eggs are planted by developers. Cybersecurity is about unplanned threats popping up where you least expect them. We can't all hope to stumble upon the right combo for privacy as easily as a gamer hitting up, up, down, down, left, right, and unlocking God mode. Knowing in-game secrets shapes surface skills. Real-world encryption is the deep dive. It keeps the bad guys out for real, not just until the next checkpoint. Serious stuff, definitely no cheat codes there. You know, Simon, that takes me back to my college days. I remember this one time a few friends and I became obsessed with the legendary secrets of an old text-based adventure game. We'd spend nights decoding cryptic messages and navigating labyrinthine dungeons, convinced every dead end had a clue. These sessions turned into something more than just gaming. They sparked a passion for unraveling complexities. One buddy, in particular, took it all to heart. Fast forward a couple of years, he's now a cybersecurity analyst. He always says those late-night gaming marathons taught him to look beyond the surface. Our pixelated adventures subtly shaped his approach to unexpected scenarios, recognizing patterns where none seem to exist, much like how Easter eggs train us to think about hidden layers. It wasn't the actual skills, but the mindset, that attention to obscured detail that made all the difference when he transitioned from virtual quests to securing digital fortresses. That's wild, Joe. Who knew those late night sessions were like boot camp for brainy battles against digital dragons? Just goes to show, the line between play and protect can get blurry. Easter eggs messing with our heads could be the first stealthy step to thinking like a security pro. It's not about A plus B equals cybersecurity. It's that thirst for secrets that gets the gears going. What's next? More hidden treasure leading to legit lockdown skills? You know, Simon, speaking of secrets in the digital realm, it reminds me of those avatar mishaps in virtual worlds where things get a little leaky. Ever had your cover blown in game by something ridiculous? Let me tell you about this one time my character was so bugged out, I might as well have sent out invitations to my personal info party. You want to laugh? Buckle up. Oh, no way. I've got to hear this. The thought of you unintentionally throwing a data disclosure shindig is just too good. Give me the scoop. What went down with your buggy avatar? What? Seriously, that's fantastic. I mean, not for your virtual privacy, but the story has to be gold. So what happened? Did your avatar just go rogue and start oversharing? Can't wait to hear this one. Hit me with the details. Oh boy, leaks in the virtual world. Talk about embarrassing. I've had my avatar literally spill the beans thanks to a lovely glitch. Picture this, I'm deep into this stealth mission, right? Somehow a bug has my character spouting off my real name instead of the in-game alias in voice chat. There went my incognito status, totally blown. I could almost hear the other players laughing through their headsets. Took username a little too literally, and let's just say, I was the talk of the server till news of someone else's epic fail took over. Sorry listeners, seems we've hit a glitch ourselves. It's time to wrap up for today. Thanks for tuning into our virtual comedy of errors. Make sure you're back here tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern to catch more tales from the infinite side of life. Until then, keep your avatars tight and your real names out of sight. Catch you next time on Infinite Podcast.